So probably I think we might start. Uh, we reached uh, more or less 100 participants. So I think it's time to go. Uh, well, uh, it's uh, an honor for me to uh, present Francesco Nori. So for those who don't know, uh, Francesco hired me the first time. So thanks to Francesco, actually I'm here. He hired me as postdoc. I sent that email by night, Francesco answered. So oh, Francesco is uh, more than a friend. Uh, and then Francesco, uh, around, so Francesco has been leading the dynamic interaction control lab where I was a postdoc together with uh, uh, Silvio Traversari in the beginning, Francesco Romano that now joined, uh, Francesco Nori at Google DeepMind, also Luca Fiorio, and Jora Bib that is now GoPro. So it's really an intimate, uh, it's been a really nice to, to have uh, Francesco here and an honor for us. Uh, to have Francesco Nori that uh, works now at Google DeepMind Robotics and he left IIT around 2017. So, oh, Francesco, oh, it's, uh, the stage is yours. Please, uh, thank you very much and please uh, uh, tell us about your fantastic work. Thanks, thanks, Daniele. Um, thanks everyone for being like so numerous at, the, at this presentation. Let's really try to uh, make it more like a, a one-to-many conversation as opposed to me speaking to only a um, bunch of people on remote um, conference. So um, I will briefly, what my usually what I do is just going briefly through DeepMind, what it is and what is our mission, because I really think it's really important to understand the mission of DeepMind before actually understanding what we do in robotics at DeepMind. And then I will try to touch upon a few papers that we published that will give you a sense of um, why and how we want to tackle the major challenges if you interpret robotics in the way that DeepMind interprets science in general. So I will go through uh, things that are very standard in machine learning, uh, learning from human supervision, learning from first person demonstrations, learning in multi-agent settings, uh, gen learning to generalize, which is an important part of uh, what I will present. And then at the end, I will also add something very recent. It is like a micro paper that we will publish this year, next year, actually this year. Um, uh, which is more related to the um, leg locomotion stuff that uh, Daniela has been doing a lot with me in the past, but with a different flavor since this is very, really connected to what we're doing now at DeepMind. Uh, so what is DeepMind? Um, I think it's important to, first of all, keep in mind a definition of uh, intelligence to understand what we are doing at DeepMind. And the working definition that we adopt within the mind is uh, to define intelligence as the ability to learn and perform well in a wide range of, of environments. And uh, um, the important bit here is really the wide range of env environments. So with respect to other type of research, especially in robotics, but also in other, um, in other companies, in other fields of, this, of science, we are really keen to explore uh, this uh, generality of the solution that we come up, we come up with. We don't want to um, handcraft solutions to one specific task, but we're trying to do something that will cover multiple things at the same time. Um, and, uh, um, and this is important because our mission is kind of bold. Uh, it says uh, solve intelligence and use it for the good of humanity. That's like the standard uh, core corporate kind of uh, um, a mission that you always try to, uh, to, to phrase in a way that could be very inclusive of the things we're doing. Um, DeepMind was founded in 2010, but joined Google in 2014. Uh, it's a big project uh, to solve AI, artificial intelligence, in the sense that I described before. Uh, it's currently more than a thousand scientists. Uh, and definitely I can say that the way we organize ourselves is very unique. Uh, and it has like a, um, a, a very different take on different aspects of how to organize research. As I said, general purpose is important. Um, and uh, um, we, we take this by uh, approaching the problem of learning um, by starting from very raw inputs. So as opposed to, you know, trying to code some state estimation and process inputs in a way that is more understandable to us. We try to uh, start um, our, um, our representations from the very raw inputs and let uh, learning understand what representation is best for the task that we want to solve. And uh, generality, as I said before, fundamental concept here. And we I'd really like to stress on the fact that we are focusing on what we call artificial general intelligence as opposed to narrow artificial intelligence. So the idea of having something that can cover 
uh, a wide variety of uh, problems. Um, again, uh, to the essence, this is uh, really trying to come up with uh, um, code and software get, that can get sensors and produce actions. And these are really the two most important ingredients. Um, the tool that we use, the mathematical tool that we use to do that is uh, often reinforcement learning, sometimes a supervised learning. Um, but I think this is a, it's good to just remember what that is because it's actually one of the reasons why we believe what we're doing is very general. Uh, so for us, a problem, um, the, the problems that we're interested in are those in which you can define an agent, which is your software, your controller, uh, your policy, call it as you want, that um, can produce actions onto the environment. And then the environment uh, is somehow modified by these actions and uh, will in general produce some new measurements that we call observations in this context. And eventually the agent, so the controller, is tasked with the problem of optimizing some sort of reward that is uh, somehow describing the um, effect of actions in the environment. Um, and I, I, I put a, a question mark uh, in the reward uh, um, block just because I think it's really important to understand even in the context in which we are operating. So in the generality of uh, trying to solve multiple tasks is difficult to uh, come up with a reward. Um, it's difficult because it's easy when you have a narrow problem when you want to do something very specific, but then if you just want to do something very general, then it becomes really tricky. Um, and an, an important element of how we do things at DeepMind is to code the agent as a neural network. And in particular, with a really large neural network, uh, with the idea that uh, um, this neural network can uh, represent the complexity of the environment and be able to understand the environment in a way to take actions in the best way. And that's an important bit that will basically be present in the overall presentation. Uh, following this approach, just a brief reminder of what we did in the past. Uh, very first uh, uh, interesting paper was the one published on Nature, where we have proven, uh, proven that uh, uh, we can basically train an agent that uh, plays video games. In video games, the reward is very clear. It's just you know the highest score you can uh, you can get, or the, the more new things that you can discover in the game. Um, we can solve a video game from images, so just from the video of the video game, um, and producing actions uh, as, a, as, a, um, as, op, as, a, as a way to uh, solve the video game and get the maximum score. Um, similarly, uh, we approached other problems in the past. Uh, nature, and the nature paper was uh, the one where we uh, described how we uh, solve or actually probably solved is a, is a strong word, but we played against the, um, uh, the, war, the world champion in Go, the, uh, the chess game, which is very famous in Asia. And we were able for the first time to beat a human at playing Go, which was believed to be a very complex game. Um, I will skip this because there's no need to go into the details of Go. But since then, uh, we have seen a lot of ways where machine learning and enforcement learning can be applied. A few examples, uh, we have been applying machine learning in the context of uh, predicting eye disease. We have been applying uh, um, uh, deep reinforcement learning in the context of playing StarCraft, which is a game um, um, very different from uh, chess and Go, just because it uh, entails some um, hidden information. So you don't have a complete description of the environment. Somehow you need to um, bet on certain things happening without knowing exactly, without being able to measure those. So I think that um, um, the, the key word here is like hidden information. So something that you don't know completely the game and therefore you need to make some predictions and understanding of what is not visible to you. Another important uh, application uh, that is associated to DeepMind is this uh, alpha fold. Uh, this is like a machine learning algorithm that can uh, predict the 3D structure of a protein given the amino acid sequence. And this is like, as you can imagine, the enabler for understanding how the protein works against an agent, against a virus, uh, because the shape is all that matters. Um, and the, the dynamics of the interaction are all that matters when it comes to um, understanding how it behaves with a certain, form, uh, with a certain cell within a certain uh, virus or uh, in the context of uh, helping with uh, with diseases. Um, 
machine learning in general, I think I wanted to um, just give a brief highlight of what are the important things that uh, um, recently have shown the power of this technology. Um, this is very old stuff, um, but the row on the top gives you an idea of um, how um, we can use a deep neural network, so uh, a neural network with many layers, to represent um, the statistics of faces, and in particular, in this case, um, photorealistic images of uh, VIP people. Those are sampled from a distribution that tries to encode all possible VIP faces. Um, and these, therefore, are faces that do not exist, but that can be generated out of uh, learning the distribution of uh, faces. Um, that's like, I think, um, quite a, one of the first achievements in this context, which was then uh, generalized into realistic images of more diverse set of objects. You see now here on the bottom uh, examples that are now very old, but very realistic images of different classes like dogs, food, and so on. This is no longer an interesting slide, but I really wanted to, to just you know, bring it up again, yet what more. Yet, yet once more, because now with ChatGPT, you can have like a go at doing everything that is in on this slide, but also try your own things, which is like the amazing part of things. When I was doing this a year ago, I was like really telling to all my friends, uh, this, um, you know, chatbot is amazing. You can do things that are, you know, completely free form. Um, I've seen that Ugo is connected to, to, the, uh, to, the, to the call as well. And, um, when I was playing with this uh, with this uh, chatbot, I realized that uh, uh, it was basically a way to have a completely free form free form interaction with with some sort of intelligence, and reminded me of when we were doing the IOL demo, the um, interactive object learning demo, where everything was very structured. The whole sequence of things that we could do was a finite state machine where things were going through a certain cycle. What is really impressive about these language models is like you can have them doing whatever you want. Like you have a few examples here, um, one uh, one down here, bottom left is to produce code that will create a palindrome or checking if it's a palindrome, a piece of text. Um, down here, you see how you can use these uh, language models to make them uh, translating things. Um, and then uh, one that is very dear to me is the one on the bottom right here, where you see that you can even get a sense of what affordances uh, certain objects have. Like you have here uh, affordances of a potato, of a laptop, of cookie dough, and, and so on. I think that's like basically squeezing in a language model a lot of the knowledge that is typically um, you know, a sort of social understanding of things. And, and this is really impressive to me. Uh, so if you didn't play with ChatGPT, we really have to get it a, give it a go because it's like impressive to me. And I think it's something that as a scientist you should do because it's fun to play with it. And it's also quite um, um, enlightening to see and do it and shaping it to do what you want to do, which is like a, the exercise that I think is only possible now that OpenAI released it as an as a, uh, open API for everyone. Uh, you can also play some logic, and I, I did it too. I hope you did it because this is like really cool. Um, in this case, like the logic of sequences, you can uh, basically um, have um, these language models understanding logic, which is something really unprecedented. Other things that I'm honestly immensely impressed by, um, you, you should use, if you are not doing it, use Copilot and give it a go again. Copilot is... Um, um, an assistant that will you will, will can be a plugin in your Visual Studio IDE, and will allow you to complete code depending on what you have written before and what you know your comments that you have in your code. You see how predictive these models can be. Uh, at DeepMind, we did something different. Um, it's uh, uh, it's called Alpha Code. It's just an AI that participated to a competition of coding from English language, you need to produce the code that solves a certain problem. So it's really translating pure English into pure code, but it's also competing with humans, uh, which are like actually competing because they believe they are good coders. And uh, um, AlphaCode really performed well in this competition, uh, being able to basically be uh, in the 50% of the top participant to this com competition for coding, which is again, I think really, really impressive. Even more so, um, 
this is uh, uh, something that impressed me even more. Um, this is like uh, what we call visual language models. Uh, it's a way to get a representation not only of images as we have seen before, but also um, of text. So you get this intertwined representation, the statistics of images and text all together. And then you can query, um, for example, like in this case, from text, you want to produce an image. So that's the problem of, you know, from text to, to, to images. and the visual quality of these images is like mesmerizing to me but i also think that what is really import important here is that you you can disentangle the information that is on an image where is where the information is really all mixed together uh, through language where information is actually very um, discrete like names of objects are you know very discrete as opposed to the continuity of different objects that exist in nature so you basically have this ability of these net of these uh, networks and these representations to disentangle concepts like transparency or you know duck or glass or painting uh, through language into an image and then combine them again into the uh, the combination of those. So let's just look at a couple of examples that are really cool to see. This is like a transparent duck sculpture of a, um, a transparent sculpture of a duck made out of glass. The sculpture is in front of a painting of a landscape. And as you see here, like the language, like duck is a concept that we all know about. And, you know, transparency is another concept. And probably there's no transparent duck in front of this painting. Um, and there's actually and now quite understood that is the case. There's not such a thing. And still you can disentangle and recombine the information into an image. I think this is really impressive. Um, a dragon fruit wearing a karate belt in the snow. That's also kind of cool because, again, it's very made up. I understand you might not be as surprised as I am if you play with these models. And nowadays you can. Today you have, like I think, 50 trials, 50 attempts on DALI 2 um, to actually produce images like this. Once you start playing with it and you do it on your own, you can really understand what this is about. Um, it's important to keep in mind, I think, that the progress is on, um, on being able to um, train these large models. They go on many different directions. And uh, there have been progresses in the network, uh, network architecture. And you see here examples of the most popular ones. Uh, on the right-hand side, this is the latest uh, popular uh, neural network architecture. is uh, called transformers. I really think it's important it's fundamental for us to look at the details of it because they include things that are well known to be happening in the brain like attention system um, um, convolutions uh, and then um, sampling and very very dense connection of, of, of um, um, information this is all fundamental to get the result that we have seen um, and i think that's an important area of research is to understand how to represent neural architecture that can preserve the information in the way that we believe is, pres is preserved uh, in our way, in the way we interpret the reality. And the other important bit that I wanted to mention is that uh, technology is also making really step forward. Um, and one thing that impressed me when I really started uh, uh, being interested in machine learning and deep neural networks is that we are not too far from the numbers that uh, we believe are the average numbers of, for example, synapses in the brain or neurons in the brain. Um, so the networks that we are, we've seen the results of, so something like DALI2 or GPT, chat GPT, um, they have 200 billions of parameters. Um, so that uh, accounts for like um, something like uh, um, at the three order of magnitude less than the, the synapses in the brain. So we're not really far because uh, we're talking about two to the power of 12 uh, with respect to two, uh, sorry, 10 to the power of 12 with respect to 10 to the power of 15. So the relative gap is really, really narrow. Uh, of course, we're not representing the information the same way. I'm not saying that, but uh, this is to say that the, the quality of, you know, the connections and the the kind of uh, hardware behind these kind of models is really reaching what the capacity of the brain is. 
Let's go to robotics. What is so special about robotics? Well, I think there is a problem to translate these all uh, results into robotics because, first of all, uh, robotics is difficult because it relies on you know a lot of degrees of freedom. It's highly dimensional. There's a continuous action space. Um, it's um, definitely um, have constrained by the real world. Uh, there's not in it's not easy to get like a lot of attempts at doing things. So data collection is a problem. Uh, hardware changes. There's a lot of wear and tear. Um, there's a lot of sensor noise. Um, robotics is intrinsically multimodal. So we have been you know, talking about language and images, but this is just two of the many different sensors that uh, um, we rely as humans in order to execute the many tasks that we do every day. There's proprioception, there's vision, there's haptics, and many more. Um, and uh, um, robotics is also very, very wide. It has a lot of diversity. Many things can be done. Uh, therefore, many rewards, if you want, or tasks that can be done with the robot, with a human and a robot, for example. It's like really, really huge. And this is very different from producing one image out of one piece of text. What is the secret to get there? Well, I really think what uh, uh, the challenge is, the challenge that we are facing is that um, it's easy to uh, feed a robot with um, images. It's easy to feed a robot with um, sound. It's easy to um, feed a robot with, um, with text. But uh, at the moment, we are really lacking ways to describe what affordances or what can be done in the environment um, in order to complete the task that we want the robot to complete. Um, it's the description of what can be done in a scene. Once you have a scene, is something very human. And uh, I think that's a problem of communication. How can we communicate a lot of different things to a robot? And how can the robot then learn on this uh, uh, description of the task that we want them to do? So it's a problem really of defining what is the way to get this data uh, to the robot. And within this framework, I would like to touch upon a few papers that we published. I think I'm just touching on the main bullet points and the main things that are really keen to crack in order to advance robotics in the direction of generality. So the first one is what we call, what we call learning with supervision. So uh, the idea is uh, how can we get the human in the loop when we are teaching our robots to do many different things? Um, let me skip through the animation here. Um, the way we approach this is actually quite standard nowadays in robotics, but uh, uh, let me just briefly go through it. So the first step is um, we provide demonstrations of what we want the robot to do. And it's typically a, um, really a, what we call a third person demonstration. So we move the robot through a game pad or a joystick in order to perform a certain action. Um, and then uh, we store this data. Um, we also tell the robot uh, uh, how good uh, the execution of the action is. So as soon as we have the demonstrations, we can also say, OK, in this phase of the movement, you are doing it right. In the other phase, you were not doing it right. Not that once we have that, we can do um, um, a representation of this information. So how good the, the robot was performing that particular action through, again, a neural network. That's what we call learn, learning the reward. So that's like an, a sort of way to extract the information that the human is uh, feeding through um, um, sketching a reward. So just saying when the action was performed in the right way versus what, when it was not. So that we have all the ingredients to do some learning uh, of, um, um, of, the, of, of the tasks in simulation, or like in this case, just retrieving the data and choosing the data that were performing the, uh, the task in the right way. Then we have a step of evaluation where we evaluate whether, whether or not the robot is doing the right thing, and we keep iterating this, this wheel. So we, we keep um, adjusting uh, the way the robot is performing things. We keep learning a reward, and then we, we will, um, uh, again, try to improve the controller and the policy uh, to, uh, through an evaluation. You see here a little bit of uh, what I'm talking about. I've, I've been really skimming through uh, this uh, work really fast because it's also pretty old at the moment. So not really super interesting. But anyway, what the idea here was um, to have um, a task, like in this case, I think it's just uh, uh, put the green object on top of the red one. 
uh, and uh, and the on the left you see the first results of uh, after giving some demonstrations of the task, um, and then on the right hand side after just three loops of the cycle that I was showing before. Um, so this is uh, when you uh, demonstrate the task. Um, another another work that I think it's very relevant is uh, learning uh, from demonstration uh, in first person uh, through uh, motion capture. So in this case, um, it, this is uh, again an old paper, but I think it's very relevant. Um, we what we did is um, first of all we captured uh, a bunch of uh, uh, motion primitive oh, sorry uh, demonstrations of uh, of tasks. I think in this case was more or less a thousand different humanoid tasks. So we um, sensorized the person, we motion captured the uh, the movements, and we uh, stored a lot of demonstrations, like a thousand different tasks, which included running, uh, jumping, uh, lifting a box, as you see here, and catching something and so on. And uh, all of this information, which if you want, can be represented as a manifold of possible configuration of the body to execute a wide variety of objects can be uh, represented as um, uh, in, a, in a particular form uh, that is uh, inspired by uh, what we call a variational autoencoder. But the idea is that you basically squeeze the information about what this manifold is into uh, a latent representation, which is a very condensed, uh, de de uh, demonstra uh, very condensed representation of the variety of configurations of the posture of the body that are needed in order to complete the set of actions. But it's very condensed because the, uh, the representation goes through a bottleneck of information that we call latent space, uh, sort of a very um, rich way of doing a PCA, so that the um, condensed information will be way smaller than the initial one. So the, the information will be the same, but the dimensionality of the state space will be much smaller. And then what we can do, and I will show you some examples of this, um, is uh, we can just ask um, um, an RL agent, so a, a controller, to uh, choose only this small set of uh, representations, so not the entire space, but just move and explore in the, in the vicinity of this manifold of actions that uh, uh, was used to uh, generate the representation. And then this will simplify immensely the, the learning problem. I think I have hopefully a video here. And you see what we can train in this case uh, is um, a humanoid running. Uh, in The only information provided to the agent is the vision that you see on the left hand side. So um, the, the humanoid, this avatar, uh, is uh, tasked with the problem of reaching uh, the most distant point in this uh, sort of uh, platform. And uh, the only information for the agent to, um, to, for the controller to understand there is a gap and therefore needs to take a jump is the vision that you see on the left. So this is kind of a complicated task. Uh, but still, through the, uh, the reduction of the action space, uh, in this idea of uh, condensing a lot of different actions, you see that you get some realistic motion, uh, not really fully realistic, but at least very human-like. Plus, you can modify them in, uh, in order to complete a very complicated task like this one, which is, as I said, uh, jumping through a set of uh, gaps uh, by just using proprioception and vision to get a sense of what is you know, the gap that is in front of me, when I, do I need to jump? Um, going forward to the next one, um, similar and an evolution of this work uh, was um, um, ported to the problem of learning similar behaviors, but in a multi-agent setting where you have not just one, um, one agent, but multiple of them. Um, and this ended up being uh, exactly the approach that I described. Um, but in the context of uh, soccer, so um, Again, um, you have like a little bit of a better video here. Um, the first step, as you see, is to mimic a certain motion capture trajectories. Uh, the, of course, the motion capture tra trajectory is not uh, physically realistic. This is just a motion capture, while the uh, avatar in, in orange here is actually um, ob obeying to the law of physics in Mujoko. So you see that. Um, this is like sort of porting of these motion primitives. These are the motion primitives I was describing before. So this is like the entire set of things that uh, uh, describe a wide variety of tasks. Um, then second step, oops. Oops. That's right. 
is to use this information to learn a, a more complicated task, which is uh, soccer. Uh, so the multi-agent part comes from having not just uh, one avatar, but is in this case, four different avatar. And the peculiarity of this approach is that, again, uh, in, in this case, um, you, you are tasked with something which is very different from uh, the actions that you initially had, but there was some, you know, running, turning, uh, squatting, jumping, and so on. And in, in this case, we, this old set of primitives can be combined to play a very realistic game of soccer, realistic in the sense of physics, because the way um, each agent, is, each uh, player is actually moving is by controlling the uh, joint torques. So it's actually um, very different from classical video game where you know, movements are neglected and you just care about the movement of the ball. Here, when you want to kick, you really need to choose the right uh, torques to give to the uh, leg in order to kick the ball. And as you see, first of all, they are very realistic, but also they come up with really, really um, uh, naturalistic behavior and very naturalistic strategies. Plus, on top of that, you have clearly some um, planning which goes beyond the immediate trying to get uh, uh, to get uh, to the ball, but uh, there is such a lot of coordination and abilities to understand the game and accordingly take the action. Uh, I would keep looking at this video forever because I really love this video, but unfortunately I need to move to the next slide. It's like really interesting behaviors that we get. Okay, I think I'm really doing great with the, with the squeezing of, uh, of the, uh, the talk into a smaller amount of time. So uh, this is a more recent paper and it gives you a little bit of a flavor of the things that we are now trying to investigate. Let me, let me check. Um, I heard the noise. I hope everything is fine. Feel free to talk if I'm like running late or you have a question. Uh, it's fine. It's fine, uh, Francesco. I think you can. Yeah. Okay. So this is a recent paper. Uh, it also gives a little bit of, uh, um, of the flavor that I was uh, talking about at the beginning. Um, we basically took a very extreme approach. Uh, and this was really an exercise of understanding how far can we go with diverse tasks? How, how far can we go by having a single neural network trying to solve a variety of different tasks? And this was really extreme. When the first time people talked to me about this particular initiative, I thought it was like a waste of time, if I have to be sincere. Um, because it's really, the way it was appro approached internally was really extreme. So you see here the variety of tasks that we tried to um, feed to an agent in such a way that we wanted this agent to learn um, all of these tasks and possibly find correlations between the tasks. That was the tricky bit. So let me start from the top left corner here. This is like a simulated 3D, 3D environment where you are in a sort of maze and you have like um, uh, a bunch of objects and you need to find. In this case, you really look for um, uh, finding a, a golden apple in, in a maze with different tricks where you need to do, um, you need to do some uh, logic uh, and some you know, uh, opening doors, finding the keys to open the door, go to the second floor and so on. Uh, looks a lot like video games and it's called dm lab it's now a standard environment it is available um, also if you you know for whoever is interested in using it to do complicated planning problems um, this is the playroom another simple you know everyday room kind of thing where you have a bunch of objects and again the task is to move objects around put them on a tray then remove it from the tray and, and it's really high planning kind of tasks then we have some manipulation tasks. This is a jacko arm. You probably don't see it, but it's like a, sing, a seven degrees of freedom arm on a tabletop scenario where you have a bunch of objects and you're supposed to move them around. Then you have, um, this is like Atari games, uh, the two set of Atari games where you, you are uh, trying to solve the classical vintage video games. Uh, so a completely different thing. It's not really related to robotics. Then you have, what we call RGB stacking, which is an environment, um, a robotic environment with an arm, parallel gripper, and the task is to place objects in a specific configuration, like stacking pyramids and different kind of forms. Then uh, Terry game already uh, described. This is DM control. This is a, a control suite. There is a, a set of tasks, and again, um, and in this case, you have a little bit of robotics, but not too much. Uh, it's more like a, a free-form set of control problems. 
where you have inverted pendulum, card pole, and many others. Another task was simply language. So the one I described it before, kind of a chatbot where you have question and answering problems. So we really wanted to, this agent to understand how to talk to people and how to interact with people through language. Uh, this is like a visual language model. So in this case, uh, very similar to DALI 2 or whatever uh, task is uh, related to associating text with images and vice versa. And then it's like meta world, it's another robotic task. Um, so what I'm trying to describe here is that we did the exercise of getting all the tasks that was like available to us, that were avail available to us, to, to us, and try to have an agent performing well on all of these tasks and hope for the, some generalization. Uh, so go through the paper if you're interested, but the results of the paper are multiple. Uh, one result which is obvious is that it's possible to do that. So we do have a single agent, it's called Gato, and this agent is capable of solving all of these tasks with a decent amount of accuracy without regressing on other tasks. So it somehow can maintain and uh, retain the information in each task individually and being able to understand whenever it's facing one of these tasks, which one is to be solved. So to produce the right actions that will solve that particular task. So it can play video games, can talk to you, or can um, stack objects in, in the real world um, by uh, using an arm, a robotic arm to move objects around, which is kind of cool, I have to say. Um, what, why did I brought this up? Uh, because I think uh, what we were kind of extremely surprised by is that we could solve uh, a task which was completely new. We never actually gave um, you know, enough data to solve this task. This is a, a task of uh, grasping a blue object and stacking it on top of the green. Even though there was a lot of different tasks of this, this type, this particular task was not there was never tasked nor, demonstra nor demonstrated how to do this. And with language conditioning plus um, 500 demonstrations, which uh, to our under current understanding is really very, very few demonstrations, we could get a 60% uh, success rate on this task, which we believe is really impressive. So we are now exploring even more in this direction because generalization, so the ability to do new things with very few demonstrations is something that is extremely interesting, as you can imagine, in this context. Okay, and then I'm left with the last one that I added just because I know that uh, Daniele's group is interested in certain things that are uh, present in this paper that we, pub we will publish at ICRA uh, this year. So in this particular work, what we wanted to do is basically explore the possibility of bringing reality into simulation, then train uh, a controller, an agent in simulation, and then deploy on the real system. So that's like um, a, quite, a, quite a loop. So you start with reality, you bring reality into Mujoko, into the simulation environment, you train an agent, so you solve a certain number of tasks in simulation and then you you uh, you use this trained policy this trained controller into the real world how do we do that so uh, the first uh, flow is this one you take a video of a scene which should be static then you use a standard algorithm uh, to do structure for motion to get the relative pose of the camera in the video uh, in a few poses of the video then you use this to train what we call a nerf modeling which is just a way to preserve the geometric information to this, of the scene and make a 3D uh, representation of this, this, this 3D scene, which is extremely accurate. So eventually after this nerf modeling, which is a way to uh, get the reconstruction of the scene, you get a very detailed 3D reconstruction of the scene. But now that you have a 3D reconstruction of the scene, you can render the, any position of the camera. So in this case, we have a cute little humanoid um, placed in the scene. So we can even simulate what would the, would the, would the, the humanoid see if it were in a particular uh, position in, the play, in this particular playground that we captured. Uh, so let me say that again. You have like this rigid scene. You now have a modeling of the scene. Now you can render a view of any camera position in the scene. So basically, if you are simulating a, a humanoid walking in that scene, you can know what the 
what the robot will see uh, in that particular pose. And you can just um, use and these images to as if they were the real ones because they are extremely realistic. So you see here down here what we get. You you basically use the position of the camera in the scene. You use the simulation environment, and then you can feed to and generate what would be the see the view of the robot from that particular position. And you can even add objects like in this case we added uh, um, a red ball to the scene. Let me just show you what I mean. So in this video, you see on the left, a uh, recording from the robot uh, walking in the scene. That's on the left. And surprisingly, on the right is the same um, view. But in this case, what we, we have, we use some markers to know where the robot is in the real world. And then this is like the simulated view through the pipeline that I just described. And as you see, it's like even more crispy and more precise if you want, just because there's no blur and the camera is better. But you see how precise this is. This is like, to me, really impressive. This is, as I said, this is simulated view in simulation. And it's like the, the, on the left, you see what eventually the robot sees. So the, the gap is really, really small. So the robot sees really the same, um, the same kind of information. Um, this is the reconstruction. This is just by... Uh, going around with the camera in the reconstructed scene. You don't get uh, too much of how precise the scene is, but believe me, it is extremely accurate. Um, this is like to say that we can add objects. So the nerf rendering, which is what I've been talking about, is this one on the left-hand side. Then you have the Mujoko scene, where you can see the robot, because the robot is not present in the scene. And uh, an object that we added, like in this case, is, a, is an orange ball. And you can create a composite rendering by just superimposing this, uh, um, this static scene with a movable object in the scene, in this case, the body of the robot and, and the ball that you are trying to chase in this case. We test this on two different tasks. Uh, the left and, on the left-hand side, the robot is tasked with the problem of um, localizing itself in the scene and then go to a target. And we test the different uh, uh, targets in this scene. But the problem is the one of, you know, basically it's, uh, it's just localization and action. You need to localize yourself in the scene from just the camera views. And, uh, um, and then uh, once you localize yourself, you need to take the steps in order to go to a certain location. In the right hand side, you see the very same, but uh, um, in a different context where in the task is to uh, interact with the ball, the orange ball that I was talking about before. You need to localize yourself in the scene. You need to localize the ball in the scene. You need to push the ball to the target. And again, um, this requires you to do some localization, estimation of the target, and then moving the target um, to the goal. Um, and this, uh, I guess, this is uh, the result that we got. So you see uh, the view. Again, this is all, the only information provided to the agent is this view of where it is. The robot needs to find itself in, in the scene and go to this target here and see how it goes around. Avoids obstacles, of course, because he, see them, he sees them, and then he goes to the right target. Um, this is the same, and in this case, uh, you want to push uh, the object to the, to the target. And again, um, a little bit more difficult to solve this task, but again, it's, uh, you need to do two things that are very difficult, as I said. Localize yourself in the map from only the vision and um, localize the object and then push the object to the goal. I think it's, that's, uh, that's very interesting. One thing that I wanted to mention is that uh, the way this is trained in simulation only, as I said, and then deployed on the real system, um, is through avoiding uh, an explicit mentioning of estimation as in the classical sense, like a Kalman filtering to understand where the robot is in the environment. In this case, um, in order to solve the task, you need to understand where you are in the scene. You need to understand, oh, now I'm facing this direction, therefore the target will be on my behind me and so on. Um, this is not explicitly uh, trained. It's not, there's no explicit common filtering. But this ability is represented by having a, a deep neural network that just takes as images, images as an input, plus uh, IMU and joint positions and other uh, small uh, classical um, observations that you have, classical sensors you have, and then produce the, um, the action as, uh, as, as uh, called here the policy mean. Um, 
surprisingly, and I think this, uh, well, there's a bunch of videos here. You see the robot view, different tasks, again, walk into the target. Um, I'll skip this because I want to have time for questions. Uh, this uh, pushing, pushing the ball. Again, uh, the task is really localize yourself, localize the ball, push the ball to the target. Uh, so there's a lot of a lot going on here, and you know, being able to train on a single end-to-end -end, in an end-to-end -end fashion without explicitly mentioning state estimation in this whole process, I think quite interesting. And this is just a, a, a nice visualiz visualization of what I just mean. So what you will see in this video is on the left hand side um, the view of the robot. So what the robot sees during the video. On the right hand side, what you will see is a top bird eye view of uh, the scene that is actually uh, the scene where the robot is moving. Uh, the robot initially is here. You probably, see, hopefully you see my pointer. Uh, let me see if I can just, yeah. So the, ooh, uh, well, I can't do that. Well, the, the robot is down here, is on the left hand side, uh, the right hand side here. Um, and what we will see visualized on top of the scene is um, a belief of where the robot is in the scene. So um, it's uh, visualized like this uh, heat map, uh, but uh, um, what eventually is, this is like, if you want the representation of what the Kalman filter will tell you, if you explicitly have a Kalman filter into the, um, uh, into the uh, controller. Um, but this is, uh, at the moment, the way we do this is by simply extracting this information about, from intermediate representations in the um, in the uh, deep neural network. So this is kind of a, a, a post hoc way to see and double check that the information is within the network. So what you should see here is that the correlation between the um, uh, view on the left and the heat map should coincide. So you should be able to see where the robot is by looking at a heat map that is produced. And, um, and as you see here, Oh, sorry. This is a static robot, so like it's a, it's not the robot we are looking at. This uh, the X here uh, will um, will be the place where the robot is. But you see, there is quite a, a confidence uh, that the robot has uh, about knowing where it is located in the map. So let me play this again because I think that's uh, relatively cool. So you see now it's near the bucket, which is this thing over here. Then it goes around. It's near the sofa here. Now near the face. Um, and it's like, as I said, it's not coded. It's just uh, emerging naturally by, by the way the task is framed. OK, and then I'm coming to the conclusion. So uh, I think, uh, uh, first of all, I'm convinced that deep neural networks can represent very complex uh, control actions and very complex uh, representation of the information. Um, we are exploring how these controllers can be learned on real systems. Um, but I really think that uh, learning at the scale where we want to do like a lot of generalization requires a lot of additional information, either in the form of auxiliary rewards, uh, as I said, reward sketching or trying to describe where to go, first person and third person de demonstrations, multi agent learning, and so on. Um, and then uh, I think also that large neural networks uh, can represent a large amount of behaviors. And through this uh, capability of encoding different things, we already have seen signs that this can generalize to being able to learn new things with very few demonstrations. So much less information than the one that was used to train um, the representation with. Yeah, and that's it. I'm happy to take questions now. Thank you very much, Francesco. So a big uh, virtual applause, uh, let's say, from the from the audience. So the I wanted to, I open the uh, the um, uh, the question time. Uh, I'll go with uh, Donatien. So if you Donatien, if you want to proceed. Yes. Uh, hello, Francesco. Thank you for your uh, great presentation. I had a question about your uh, nerf related work. So to me, the scene that you work with seems, uh, let's say, more complex than the scene in the original NERF paper. And I guess if we want to release a robot in the wild, we'll have even more complex scene. Um, do you have an idea of uh, how the size of the, scale, the NERF network scales with the complexity of the scene? Like, did you already have to scale it up from the original paper or use the same size? 
Um, yeah, that's a good question. So um, for now, we are relying on a lot of research in the NERF uh, sort of ecosystem, um, because uh, as you said, uh, the assumptions of the original, original paper were so restrictive that they couldn't be applied to directly to robotics. Like uh, what comes to mind immediately is uh, it's not a stat it's never a static scene, especially if you want to do some manipulation tasks, you want to move things around, then you are expecting these kind of things to move and to um, be, you know, not just static, but also have things that can move. Um, so in our particular approach, we, uh, we use the Mujoko rendering, just superimpose the two and being able to scale a little bit the complexity of the model this way. But it's a very naive and simple approach. I think more recent approaches in the NERF community have shown that we can have like uh, kinematic structure and um, uh, representations where you have inch joints and other things that are very common when you're trying to describe a scene. So uh, the whole research goes under the name of compositional NERF. And there's plenty of literature, and this is going exactly in the direction of giving more degrees of freedom and therefore scale it up to more complex scenes where geometry can be applied, not just to a static scene, but also to components of the static scene so that you have like compositionality in the way the NERF model is constructed. Um, you, there's plenty of examples, like when you open the door is a very simple example of a hinge joint where you have two components, like you have the static environment and this additional component. Um, I think all of this is very high, a very um, um, active area of, area of, area of research. And uh, I'm really, we are really looking forward to see the progresses. I think one of the big advantages of uh, um, the fact that there is so much investment in machine learning is that uh, research is really moving fast. So at the moment, we are in the situation where we, we really, um, in, we really used what is available and we're waiting for the next release to be there because other people are solving the problems we believe are fundamental to use it in a better sense in robotics. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so uh, then Michele. Hi, uh, I'm Michele, a researcher in Lorenzo's group. Thank you for the talk. Uh, as as was always, I have a question: the um, multi-agent settings and the in the soccer demo that you shown. Uh, I was wondering if you have tried to give to different agents in the same team different capabilities, like one agent that was faster, one agent taller with I don't know larger hands. So to see if they eventually learn that one should be like the striker and the other one should be the defender or even the goalkeeper. Have you tried that? Thanks. Um, let me just say something that I didn't say during the presentation. I think this is relevant to your comment. So what the um, advantage um, of uh, multi-agent uh, learning in this case is, um, and it, if you want to have an understanding of what I mean, I encourage you to have a look at the blog post from OpenAI on the hide and seek paper. This is really a great example. So if you learn in a static environment, then your learning capabilities are limited because the environment is static. There's not much you can do. It's actually very, very difficult to understand new things. Well, if you have like two things that happen simultaneously, like an ecosystem where you have opponents that do different things, um, then you have a richness. And this richness, like the one we have in nature, will encourage uh, sort of the learning process to find new things. It's sort of a little bit of noise in your evolution so that this noise will help and if the, the noise comes from another opponent or an environment or as you were saying a different body this is like just increasing this uh, this exploration so it's a matter of exploring possibilities right so we didn't do it in this paper but it's a very active area area of research and and i think it's really great i, I think it it goes in the right direction uh, the diversity in this head in this case body diversity can help uh, to uh, speed up the learning and get new things. Uh, in our case, we were primarily interested in the um, controller diversity, so the ability to do uh, things differently in the control sense. But there is plenty of literature in, on the body diversity, which is also very useful, apparently. Okay, thank you. Okay, so in order, Cheng and Giulio. Cheng. Uh, hi, thanks for the for the fantastic presentation of the work. So uh, my my question is also related to the the the, the architecture of the nerve to rail network. So when I was looking at the, um, the architecture, I'm thinking, uh, is there a way, let's say, uh, for designing the neural network that we can 
uh, guarantee the optimality or let's say uh, the local optimality of the performance. Uh, if the like say, if uh, if we, uh, we design the neural network in this way, so the loss function converts to a, a certain bound, or, or or do we totally uh, rely on the experience or uh, trial and error? So that's my question about designing the neural network. Thanks. Um, I think that's a, an excellent question. I mean, my background is in control theory, so I really care about proof of convergences. I think uh, given the size of these networks, uh, we gave up a little bit on you know, um, theoretical proofs, like the ones you can write on the whiteboard, on the blackboard. And you need to basically go in the direction of some more um, uh, numerical proofs of uh, validity of what you end up uh, obtaining. So the example of the estimation of uh, the robot position in the environment is a very good example of something that resembles a lot of what we do with the human brain. In order to understand if a certain representation is on the brain, we collect a bunch of neurons, activations, and we try to see if that information is in the brain. And that's exactly what we are doing. I, see, I think uh, you know, numerical guarantees or theoretical guarantees are now very difficult, but you can do a lot of numerical proofs where you see that a certain type of information is encoded and therefore is optimal in that sense. So I think it changes a little bit the way you look at things and how you define optimality, but still you have ways to understand if the information that you believe is fundamental or optimal to get a certain mm -hmm. performance is there or not. But there's no numerical uh, or theoretical guarantee that you eventually have in an optimal, config optimal and uh, local optimal. Okay, thanks. And also I have another more general question. That is like, uh, so in the, in, the uh, in the development of the uh, machine learning, like are we going to like focus more on the data oriented uh, model or just uh, we uh, we care less about the model in the future. For example, uh, if we have a, a um, amount of data, so and no matter what kind of uh, the neural net model is, we can reach uh, a similar or certain um, point of uh, performance. Like as less, uh, we rely, we would rely more on the data or defi defining designing different uh, neural networks, machinism or architecture. So um, I think that's a great question. I think the community is exploring everything. Uh, I also think that uh, at the moment, there is so many things to explore that some people go for the data angry, that data sort of uh, uh, intense regime where they really think all we need is data. I don't care where the data is coming from. And just give me the data. We'll try to squeeze them in a single network. And there are more like uh, theoretical approaches where instead you are trying to do something else where you in, in, indeed go in the direction of saying what network architecture can leverage better the data. I think that's very relevant. Um, Julio, it's your turn because then I need to go out because I already okay. see people yes. kicking me <laughs> yes. out my room. <laughs> yes. Uh, Julio you, Sandini, uh, Professor Sandini, yeah. the voice Thanks. in the list. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, th thanks, thanks, uh, Francesco, for the nice talk. Uh, listen, I have a curiosity in this process that you described, uh, the voxelized process, the part of the process uh, uh, where you mentioned the fact that you have a very high resolution uh, of the environment, and then you, you, you stated a few times. Uh, is, is this really necessary? I mean, which resolution do you think it is necessary? Shouldn't be dependent uh, on the task being executed? Uh, so are you wasting a lot of memory for solving uh, uh, all possible problems uh, instead yeah. of, um, uh, well, you, you know you, you know what I mean, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I relate a lot to this comment. I agree, and I think yes, the answer is yes. In this case, it's like super resolution. I mesmerized, I mean, I did structure from motion back then when, when I joined Dira Lab with you. It was like a big thing, and then it was like really difficult to get realistic 3D scenes. And nowadays, this is like so accurate that I agree with you, is more than you needed. Still, it's very interesting to see this is possible by some, some sort of geometry plus uh, very flexible representations. But I wanted to say that uh, reinforcement learning, the way it's structured, really does what you described. That's why I really like the approach, because you will never, you will never do more than it, what is needed. It's just that at the moment, you are right, we are feeding a lot of information and only the one that is needed will be eventually used by the network. But uh, in the very first stage where you create this rendering, yes, you are overdoing it. You will create like such a precise representation with details of things that will not matter in the end. 
but the eventually the controller that will execute the uh, the behavior will just use the amount of information that is needed for the task. So if, for example, there's no need to know that uh, um, the, the vase is large, I don't know, 20 centimeters and not 21, this will be completely ignored. What matters is like when you see the object, you avoid it by the amount that is needed to go to the target. So I think that resonates a lot with what happens, but not in the first stage of that paper in particular. Thanks. Ciao, ciao, Francesco. Ciao, Giulio. Okay, so I think that uh, uh, I'm sorry for closing the question time, but uh, uh, we have to close the uh, the session. So, uh, Francesco, I wanted to thank you personally for accepting uh, uh, to give a talk to, to all of us. And in the case you pass by, of course, uh, you are more than welcome to visit the labs and uh, have a talk face to face. Yeah, I'll be happy to. Thanks for hosting me. It was a great time. Good to see a lot of friends. See you soon, I hope, in Genoa. I'm definitely passing by before, you know, spring. Anyway, I, I is in London, so probably some of yeah, us can see, be there. see you in London. Let me know so they yeah. can visit the lab too. That's a great okay, opportunity great. for you to see the lab. Okay, ciao, Fra. Ciao.